If you've known me for any length of time, you will know that I am a bit of a bibliophile. I am a book lover. Of course, I don't love all books equally. Some books have a special place in my heart, like, for example, books written by Charles Dickens. Deb and I were having dinner with uh, friends of ours last week, and my friend, a fellow pastor, asked me for recommendations on summer reading by Charles Dickens. Of course, it's hard for me to pick just one. Certainly, at the top of the list of Dickens' must-reads are Great Expectations, Hard Times, and A Tale of Two Cities. Not only did Dickens write some great books, he wrote some great titles, like The Life and Adventures of Martin Chuzzlewit, Bleak House, The Old Curiosity Shop. Have you ever thought about book titles? Honestly, the title of a book has the power to make us read it or to ignore it. Some books, however, are made interesting in their title alone, like Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? Or Pride and Prejudice and zombies. I confess I haven't read that one. Or the hollow chocolate bunnies of the apocalypse. Of course, it isn't just strange titles. I really appreciate the titles that demonstrate insight into the human condition. For example, For Whom the Bell Tolls. Or She Got Up Off the Couch and Other Heroic Acts. Or Don't Pee on My Leg and Tell Me It's Raining by, do you know who it's by? It's by Judge Judy, that great sage. Speaking of books with insight into the human condition, I really like the title of this book that one of my kids had to read for a Bellevue College class. And the title of the book is, Mistakes Were Made, But Not By Me, Why We Justify Foolish Beliefs, Bad Decisions and Hurtful Acts. Don't you just love that title? Mistakes were made, but not by me. Now, I read just enough of this book to find out that it has a very liberal agenda. Uh, However, I think the point is perceptive. Our tendency to minimize or deflect our own mistakes. The chapter, chapter titles are almost as interesting as the book title itself. For example, Knaves, Fools, Villains, and Hypocrites. How do they live with themselves? Cognitive Dissonance, the Engine of Self-Justification. And by the way, we've talked about self-justification, haven't we? Pride and Prejudice, and not zombies, Pride and Prejudice and Other Blind Spots. And then memory, the self-justifying historian. At least the beginning of this book is focused on political examples of our tendency to self-justify. In fact, the title itself is meant to reflect the tendency among politicians to minimize their wrongdoings. Mistakes were made sounds a lot better than I made a mistake, right? Do you ever hear politicians making statements like this? They put a spin on something that uh, is pretty basic, like just saying, I was wrong. Politicians especially like to do this. There's also the words, I misspoke, right? Or how about, I was using alternative facts. But our concern in relation to this book is not with politicians or the willingness to admit mistakes in the public sphere, but with you and me, and the damage that an unwillingness to admit wrong wreaks on life together. We are now entering our fourth and probably final month in this series as we continue to seek biblical secrets to richer life and love. I mention this book, however, because the issue it hits on is one that Scripture touches on quite a bit in relation to life together. Listen, if you would, just to the opening paragraph of this book. It says, As fallible human beings, all of us share the impulse to justify ourselves and avoid taking responsibility for any actions that turn out to be harmful, immoral, or stupid. 
Most of us will never be in a position to make decisions affecting the lives and deaths of millions of people, but whether the consequences of our mistakes are trivial or tragic, on a small scale or a national canvas, most of us find it difficult, if not impossible, to say, I was wrong. I made a terrible mistake. The inability to admit we're wrong is significant because it results in an inability to repair damaged relationships. How many relationships are broken and continue to be broken simply because we're unwilling to admit at least our part that was wrong in the conflict? There are a few things as destructive to life together as unresolved conflict. Notice, and this is important, it isn't the conflict that is the issue. You see, a lot of people have this mistaken notion that conflict is the problem. No. Wherever two or more are gathered together, you will have conflict, right? It's the way it is. It's life on planet Earth. Conflict is not the issue. The issue is un resolved conflict and inability to work through conflict. That is the problem. And by the way, this is premarital counseling 101. Unless you're marrying someone who is unconscious or lives in another country with no ability to communicate with you, you will have conflict in your relationship. The question is not whether your conflict will occur The question is, how will you deal with it when it does occur? There's a book I've often used both for premarital and marital counseling titled Fighting for Your Marriage. The title's meant to have a double meaning. The first is obvious, and that is, are you willing to fight to make your marriage work? That's one side of it. But the double meaning comes in because what they're saying is, it's the way that we fight or the way that we have conflict that will determine whether our marriage will succeed. So fighting for your marriage means going through conflict in a way that actually is beneficial to your marriage as opposed to doing it in a way that is destructive. Here's the thing I've found about this book, however, is that it's really not just for marriage. (laughs) It's for any relationships. The the principles that it communicates, that it conveys, are, are beneficial no matter whether you're married or not, uh, or whether the relationship you're talking about is a marriage relationship or not. So this morning, we're actually not going to focus on marriage. However, there are certainly principles we're going to talk about that are very applicable. The truth is, however, what makes for a healthy marriage are the same building blocks that make all of our relationships healthy or not, responding to conflict in a manner that leads to reconciliation, greater health, growth. Today we are launching a look at 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 through 17. I invite you to turn there. What we find in 1 Peter 3, 8 through 17 are three keys for experiencing the good life. You'll find your sermon outlines with this title in your bulletins. If you didn't receive one of these sermon outlines, just raise your hand and Ragesh will be very gracious to come and share these with you. Thank you, Ragesh. I think our uh, other usher is out taking care of usher duties. Appreciate it, sir. Just raise your hand and Ragesh will get you one of those. Now, as I mentioned, you are going to be considering three different keys to the good life as defined by Scripture. From the outset, it is probably helpful to state that although all of us would like to experience whatever we deem to be the good life, not all of us have the same definition of what the good life looks like. For one person, it may be sitting on a bass boat reeling in the big one. Doesn't that sound like the the good life? For another... It is lying on a sandy beach soaking in the sun. Really? I just, I I can't relate to that. But there are those members of my household who would say that is the good life. But although our pictures of the good life, as far as 
geographical locations or pastimes may be different, almost everyone agrees that most important to the good life is healthy relationships with others, especially in our family, in our church family, with our God. Think about this for a second. You can have whatever your definition of the good life might be. Maybe it's that new car, that nice house, that whatever big toy you want. You may get that thing. But if your relationships are a mess, then I would say that you're not going to experience the good life. And this is a principle that we see in Scripture and a principle we're going to find actually in our passage today that if we want to experience the good life, it's much more than about relation. It's much more than about, I should say, the stuff we have and about relationships. And just as an aside, I may have already shared this with all of you, but I really loved the fact that when a Union Gospel Mission representative was interviewed by one of our news channels, and it was in the context of housing, because the news channel was kind of they're stating the case that if we just buy enough housing for the homeless, that will fix the problem. And so this person, this interviewer, this news correspondent is talking to this UGM worker who's actually out on the street delivering meals to homeless people. And she goes up to him and she says, so is it the housing that's the issue? She's basically leading him, wanting him to say something like, yes, we just need more housing and that will fix all of the problems. But this is what he says in response instead. He says... The issue is not housing. The issue is relationships. We need to connect these people in relationship with their families, with the church family, with their God. I'm sure, I don't know what this lady thought. It's, it's like, oh, okay, thank you. Uh, next. But you know, he's, the same is true, believers, the same is true with regards to the homeless as it is for each and every one of us. The key to the good life is not housing, it's not stuff, it's not money, it's not having our needs met or all our wants met. It is right relationships. If your relationships are healthy and strong, then the things are simply secondary. And it's true for all of us. So, we come to... The first of what is going to be three sermons on this passage, and this is a rich passage. We're just going to take some of the first part. And what we find in the first part of this passage is that the good life is intimately connected with the fact that we are called to community. And of course, this is true for all of us as human beings, but it's especially true for those of us who are followers of Jesus Christ, because when we are brought into The church, we are brought into his family, and we are called to be in community. And that's what we find as we begin reading in first chapter, excuse me, first Peter chapter three, verses eight and nine. Follow along as I read. First Peter three, beginning in verse eight. Finally, all of you live in harmony with one another. Be sympathetic. Love as brothers, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult, but with blessing, because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. Now, the the question is here is, do you want to inherit a blessing? Do you? In other words, do you want to experience a life that is blessed by God? both here and in eternity. Then, Peter says, follow these instructions. Have you ever gotten a piece of Ikea furniture or something similar and decided that you didn't really need to read the instructions? I mean, it's obvious how this thing goes together. We got this very large cabinet that I put together uh, downstairs. And... uh, after I got most of it put together, there was one more piece I was trying to work in. I was like, well, this isn't fitting right. There's something wrong. And I realized that way, way back in the process of putting it together, I put one piece in backwards. 
And because I put it in backwards, the holes weren't lining up. So I had two options. I can make it work, or I can take the whole thing apart and redo it the right way. Can you guess which option I chose? Yes, I made it work. And so it is that way to this day, because I thought to myself, you know what? Instructions, who needs them? God's word is filled with instructions that, if obeyed, lead to blessing. The instruction in today's passage is specifically tied to how we relate to each other in community. Last Sunday, we touched upon the importance of communion. Today, we are going to consider keys to experiencing richer communion or community. And we find these keys at the beginning of the conclusion of Peter's first letter to the church. So Peter writes an entire letter. He starts off with a lot of theology as Paul and Peter are prone to do. They start off with some theology. They give some instruction and applications, and then they come to conclusion. So Peter comes to his conclusion very early on in the book. So he says, finally, he says, okay, this, this, this is the end. This is, you know, these are the things that I want to focus on before I finish writing this letter to you. And so in verse 8, Peter has just gotten through giving some very specific instruction on how we are to live as God's chosen people, how to experience a God-blessed life, and it flows from the theological instruction earlier in 1 Peter. And I actually quoted from it last week. I didn't do it intentionally uh, to lead into this passage, but it's 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, is some of this great theology. He says, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God so that you may declare the praises of him who has called you out of darkness and into his glorious light. Is it glorious? It is glorious, but in this verse it's actually wonderful. So into his wonderful light, wrapped up in our purpose in life, is living in a way that brings glory to God. God says, I've called you to be this holy nation, this people set apart, so that you may declare my praises to the nations. Believers, what a privilege it is for us to be those who are declaring God's praises. And even as these kids come into our church to declare God's praises to them all week. Does anyone know the theme of our VBS this week? Sky? What's the rest of it? Anyone? I... Sky's the limit would be a very nice one, but that's not exactly what we're looking for. I think it's along the lines of everything is possible with God. And this is what we want to teach these kids, that if they seek God, they will see that He is faithful. He's the faithful one we've sung about this morning. So we get, to, we get to glorify his name before these kids this week. What a, what a privilege. He goes on to write, however, in chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, Dear friends, I urge you, as aliens and strangers in the world... By the way, do you think of yourself as an alien and a stranger? We're not talking about UFOs here, right? We're talking about those who are far from their homeland. Do you think of yourself that way? Because believers, this is not our home. We are passing through. Our home is in the presence of our God for eternity. So he says, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. So what does it look like to live as an alien stranger in the world? The answer is found in part in the character traits described in 1 Peter 3, verses 8 through 11, where we will focus our attention this morning. Talk about alien ideas. Peter starts the list with live in harmony with each other. Harmony is a quality that seems to be severely lacking in our world today. Isn't that true? We see greater and greater dissonance in our discourse every day. Just when you thought it couldn't get worse, it gets worse. There is a lack of harmony in our world today. And sadly, it is too often missing among the people of God as well. Peter knew this. That is why he presents this as the first challenge for those who are living 
life in community. Key to community is harmony, or more literally, Paul calls it... I knew I'd do, so I'm going to do that because I'm so used to preaching from Paul. It's Peter. Peter. Peter calls us to be like-minded. The word here is homophrones. Homophrones. We know homo. Homogeneous means that we're part of the same kind, right? Of the same kind. Phrones is the word, Greek word for mind. So it's being of the same mind, being like-minded. Do you want more of the good life? Seek to be of the same mind with those with whom you're in community, especially in this context with your brothers and sisters in Christ. He's not talking about uniformity here, as if we all have to speak and act and think the same way about everything. It is quite clear in the New Testament that the early church was, like our church, a diverse group of people. He's also not talking about conformity, at least not in an absolute sense, as if the key is to try your best to fit in and be just like everybody else. What he is talking about is being agreeable. Listen to one commentator's thoughts on what this agreeable attitude looks like. He says, both Paul and Peter want their readers to think alike, not in the sense of holding identical opinions, but in the sense of being agreeable and sensitive to each other's concerns and so united in a common spiritual bond. Key to community is to be agreeable and sensitive to the needs and desires of those around you. Sometimes it's very easy for us to come to church with an attitude that says, feed me. I'm not even going to mention where that reference comes from. Come see me later if you know that reference. Feed me. Give, give me what makes me feel good about myself. Help me out, meet my needs. But Peter starts off by saying, if you want the good life, you need to come with an attitude that is sensitive to the needs and desires of others. You come to church not just to be fed, but to feed, to encourage others. You say, well, how can I feed others? Do you know that when you go up to someone else and you simply say, how are you doing? What's happening in your life? We talked last week about this that was going on. How's that going on for you right now? Those things feed people. Do you know that? It's just a simple way to feed someone else is showing concern for their needs, encouraging them, praying for them. So this is how we start out. He says, if you want a recipe for health and growth, be agreeable and sensitive to each other's concerns. The question is, are we too often disagreeable and primarily concerned about that which concerns us? That is a recipe for the bad life. For a family or church where community has become toxic. And by the way, it's part of the reason why we see in our world that community has become toxic. It's because everyone is looking out for number one. Everyone is concerned about their own things. People are not looking out for the other. And wondering, how can I minister to the other person? Of course, no person or group is perfect. What we're talking about here is what is your bent? What is your demeanor, your overall attitude? Do we tend to emphasize points of disagreement? Do we feel the need to point out where we think others are wrong? We've been with people, haven't we? We all know people who are just very good at pointing out how we messed up. Uh, they're just, it's, it's could be a spiritual gift. We've talked about the spiritual gift of criticism. Uh, that's, that's my gift. I just have that. Sorry, I'm sharing, using my gift. Um, is that our natural bent to always be pointing out wrongs or is our natural bent to be agreeable, to encourage, to build up? Peter goes on from this focus on being like-minded, agreeable in verse 8, to sympathetic or as I've translated here, understanding. Sympathetic is actually a Greek word, sympathes. 
is the Greek word. So we call this a transliteration when you just take the original word and you make something that sounds like it in the new language. This is a transliteration, sympathes. And if you think about it, patheo or pathos, we talk about this if you've read any literature or gone to any English classes where they're talking about literature, Greek literature especially, pathos, intense feeling or emotion, right? And so sum, uh, the word is, is, uh, means with. So passion with or intense emotion with. In other words, it means I'm being sympathetic with you. I'm understanding what it is that you're going through. That's what he's talking about. Understanding isn't always our first response when someone shares about their trials. We have one of two responses when someone shares about their trials. Do you know what they are? The first is this. Has this ever happened to you? I'm going through this trial with my foot. And how does the person respond? Oh, yeah, reminds me when I had trouble with my foot, right? Now, you want to be able to relate to each other, but sometimes we're always thinking about how we can respond to tell our stories rather than listening to the narrative of others. The second response is to be a fixer. Are you a fixer? Ah, <laughs> thank you. Listen, don't, please don't raise any hands. We don't want to, no. But some of us tend to be wired more that way. Someone tells us a problem, we say, okay, here's how you can fix it. Let me just fix this for you. Now listen, sometimes fixing can be good if it's done right, and sometimes even telling your story about how you relate can be good. But the key thing is this, people want to be heard and understood. And so if we're too quick to fix or too quick to say, well, I, this is my story, then the thing is we're not listening to the other person. And this is what Peter's talking about. He's talking about listening to each other, understanding each other. By the way, you'll notice that Peter's depiction of life together, hmm, way off course. Come back. I'm talking to myself. Don't mind me. Next, uh, so there's actually a scripture uh, where it talks about rejoicing with those who rejoice, weeping with those who weep. Do you ever do that? I mean, is your heart attuned to what's going on in people's lives around you so that you can feel their emotion? That's what sympathes means, to be not pathetic. I guess pathetic comes from that too, but to be empathetic, to be... Uh, to feel the same emotion that someone else is going through. So that's what Peter says. Community means understanding each other. Next, in verse 8, is the call to love his brothers, or as the outline has it, loving, no strings attached. Now, we all know this word, Philadelphia, right? Philadelphia is the city of brotherly love. And it comes from the Greek. And this is the Greek word that we see here, phila, love, delphia, brother. We are to love as brothers. In other words, you're to love the way that you would love your family. Now, I have a brother, and I got to say, I'm not sure that our love for each other always looked like brotherly love, like the time he told me on the front porch to take off my pants because he's going to use my zipper to jimmy the door unlocked. It didn't work. I didn't know that, though, until I had my pants off on the front porch. I was young. I was young. But I did get my revenge because I pushed him off that same porch and broke his arm. So it's all good. No. But see, here's the thing. Sometimes brotherly love doesn't seem so loving. That's not what Peter is describing here. What Peter's describing here is that natural affection that you have for someone who is your relation. And I have, believe it or not, a natural affection for my brother. It's just natural. It's automatic. And we Usually, if, if, if it's a healthy relationship, we have natural affection for those who are our blood. And that's what Peter is talking about here. He's saying that if you are part of the family of Christ, you should have a natural affection for each other. Right? Natural affection, a natural desire to see good things happen to those who are part of your family. And... Again, it's no strings. It's unconditional kind of love that we're talking about. Next in verse 8 is the call to be compassionate or, I put here, tender-hearted. This one is a doozy. The Greek word that it comes from is splanknizomai. Splanknizomai. Now, the reason, you want to know how I remember this word when I was learning Greek? 
because it sounds kind of like spleen. And by the way, that's what it's talking about. It's talking about your inner parts. Because in Greek literature, the, your inner parts was where your emotions were. We think of it as our, pardon me, our heart up here. But the, the Greeks often talked about your emotions being in your inner parts, in your liver or in your spleen. Or I guess Sham may be less empathetic these days now that he just had his appendix removed. Um, but it's in, it's in your bowels, actually, is what they would talk about, as being where your emotions are. And so that's what he's talking about here. So I went with, instead of tender spleened or tender, you know, bowed, I went with tender hearted. And I think that's really the point he's trying to get at, is that we have hearts that are tender towards other people, that we're aware of the needs of other people, that we care for other people. Again, in the context of the church community, if you are around long enough, you will go through some tough trials together. You will see your brothers and sisters experience some pretty hard stuff that makes your heart hurt. By the way, you'll notice that Peter's depiction of life together in the covenant community does not fit well with a lot of people's notion of going to church. Try to superimpose First Peter, his description, Peter's description here of covenant community life. Superimpose that on how so many people see the church. Those who see the church as a place you just go to get your spiritual fill, your spiritual fix, and then you leave. That doesn't fit with Peter in any way, shape, or form, right? Because he is expecting that we're in community, that we, we have relationship together, we know each other, we care for each other. It goes back to that concept we've already discussed by author Mark Sayers, when he talks about the non-place. Again, the non-place is a place we can go that has the feel of community, but without the messiness of authentic, meaningful relationships. Mark Sayers argues that some churches are actually trying to cater to this non-place sort of existence. He writes, some churches will reshape themselves as kinds of Christian non-places, detached from history, relationships, and given identity, They'll be chaplains of self-realization, helping individuals live comfortably in the non-place of globalization, essentially giving a Christian sheen to the utopia of globalization. They'll deliver tips and life hacks for living life to the fullest, a new kind of prosperity gospel for the non-places of globalization. Repent will nearly disappear from their vernacular. The battle against the flesh and sin will be replaced with a program to inflate self-esteem. Believers, I want you to know, I am not a chaplain of self-realization. And we are not about simply giving a Christian sheen to the concepts of the good life that we see in our world. We are about transformation from the inside out that, is, that takes place in the context of meaningful relationships. And that's what Peter describes here. Listen, it's fine to talk about life to the fullest. It's what Jesus offered. In fact, I saw the other day, other day a church that had a sermon series going right now. I don't know where I saw it, but it's Life Hacks was the sermon series. Life hacks are okay. I mean, it's okay to have things that help make your life more efficient, but we, we need to realize and remember that what we need is something more profound than just life hacks, than just making life simpler or easier. We need transformation. We need meaningful engagement. If you want to experience the good life, you'll find it only in meaningful community found in life together. This brings us to the final trait of verse 8, the call to be humble. I've translated this self-giving. The reason for this translation is that Peter's point is not that we should be a bunch of Eeyores always down on ourselves. The word here is actually humble-minded. It's humble combined with the same word that we saw earlier. It's not homophrones, but it's humble combined with the word for, front, word for mind, phrones. One commentator says of this word, because humility was the mark of Jesus, this unity will revolve around being humble. This does not mean a poor self-concept, I'm no good, but a willingness to take the lower place, to do the less exalted service, and to put the interests of others ahead of one's own interests. 
This attitude of Jesus is surely a necessity if a diverse group is to be united in spirit. Now, all week this week, you have the opportunity to humble yourself and serve children. That's a great thing. But we're talking specifically about our relationships with each other, humbly seeking to serve one another. And it's necessary, this attitude, this mindset, if people from diverse communities are going to be able to experience community. And by the way, isn't this exactly what Jesus demonstrated for us in the ultimate way on the cross? Now, the funny thing is, in Greek literature, this word that's used here is actually a negative word. It's never used positively by the Greeks. They don't see humility as a good thing. It's only a bad thing. But in the New Testament, Jesus redeems this word and says, no, it's good to be a servant, to be one who looks out for others, not just for number one. It isn't that we, and, and, and honestly, we see it persistently in our culture, don't we? This look out for number one kind of mindset. Well, we all feel good about doing a good turn for someone who might do a do, good turn for us. But putting someone first who can offer us nothing, or even worse, what we read in verse 9 says, Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult, but with blessing, because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. The sentiment sounds nice, doesn't it? Don't repay evil with evil. That Doesn't it sound kind of nice? But think about what it's saying. It's saying that person that just flipped you off, that you're not supposed to respond in kind. That the person who just cut you off in the car, that you're not supposed to respond in anger. Peter says stuff that sounds nice, but we don't like it much. (laughs) I mean, what, Dan, are you saying I should be a doormat? Is that what you're saying? Just let people walk all over me? What's going to happen? Well, someone will walk all over you, but you'll survive. Listen, I'm not saying to an unhealthy extent that we just forego justice, you know, And I think that it's appropriate when things that are wrongs that are being done in our culture that we're able to address those things. We do need to. We don't need to sweep things under the rug. But when it's simply a wrong that I feel about against myself, then we need to more and more mimic Jesus who told us to do what with the other cheek? He said, turn it. He said, don't be so ready to pay back those who have wronged you. Let God take care of the payback. Boy, that takes a lot of faith, doesn't it? And so the word that we see here is one that encourages us to be self-giving, but it also encourages us instead to respond by being other person blessing. The word here is actually the opposite of a word we were talking about last week. Last week, we talked about speaking against. This word is talking about speaking for someone. It's like positive gossip. Hey, have you heard? We should be people who are going around blessing others with our words, who are saying good things about others with our words. Sadly, too often our lips are used not for blessing, but for cursing. James talks about this, doesn't he? Quite powerfully, when he says in James chapter 3, verses 9 through 12, with the tongue we praise, and by the way, the word praise here is the same exact word that's translated bless in 1 Peter 3. So same exact word. He says, with the tongue we praise or bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. His point is that what comes out of our mouths reflects what's in our hearts. Good words should be what comes out of those who have been redeemed, who have been transformed by Jesus. By the way, and I I already mentioned that, so here's the point that he leaves us with. He says, we should use our words to uplift rather than tear down, to encourage rather than destroy. The description continues in verse 11 of 1 Peter 3. Verse 11 says, 
Actually, I need to uh, go back to verse 10 here. Verse 10 says, For whoever would love life and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from deceitful speech. He must turn from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. Not only should we be other blessing, but we should be good doing. We should be good doers, doers of that which is good. Doing things that encourage and help and bless others. And the second half of verse 11 tells us that we should be peace pursuing. And again, you can't help but see the overlap with James chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. He says, but the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere, peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. In other words, if you want the good life, a life that is not only pleasing to you, but beneficial to you and beneficial to others, and a life that is pleasing to God, then pursue peace. Do good. Bless others. Give of yourself. Be tender, loving, understanding, and of the same mind with your family, your neighbors, but especially in this context, in the community of faith. This is the good life according to Scripture. And I would advocate this morning that this kind of good life that First Peter describes is a much better good life than the one that commercials try to sell us. This is the good life according to Scripture. Not so much about the stuff we have or the pleasures we pursue, but about our relationships with others and our God. Next Sunday, we'll go even deeper into Peter's concept of the good life, but suffice it to say that you and I have a significant part to play on how much we and those around us experience the good life. And so I'm just going to take one minute here as we conclude our time together. As you look up at these things, do you sense God speaking to you about any of these things? Do you look up at these things and say, you know what, that one in particular I think I could have a little more of in my life. Can I invite you just a moment for us to spend, spend a moment in silent prayer to just lift up anything that God's moving in your heart regarding, and then I'm going to close us in prayer. And Lord, we thank you this morning for just how practical your word is and for the deep insight it has into our own struggles. And God, it is our desire to be more and more like you, to love each other the way you have loved us, to practice the same kind of sympathy that you've shown us to be of the same mind, to be humble in the way we approach each other, to be less prone to saying things that tear down and more prone to saying things that build up. And so, God, we pray that you would keep working in our body, keep working in us as individuals to make us into the people you've called us to be. Thank you for the richness of your word. Continue your work in and through us, we pray in Christ's precious name. Amen.